I know I, what I, it I is. I can hold my own. Yeah. Against, against, Some people will say Harvey has your cadence. Well, Some people will say that Harvey has your cadence. That's your cadence. Yeah, I've heard that. If you become Miss America, you'll make about a million dollars during your reign, four or five more million thereafter if you play it right. So do I think it's a shame that you got to come out in a bathing suit and a pair of high heels? Yeah, I really do. I think you ought to have to come out butt naked. <laughs> Church is the building you attend. Church is the activity that go on once you get inside the building. That's what I'm talking about. Praying, they, they talk to God like he stay next door. You know, like he they buddy. Like he got a membership at the Y. They don't shut their eyes. Ain't no emotion in it. They just be talking to God. Oh, Father God. Steve, my man, man. Steve, my man. You trying to start some shit, man. I ain't trying to start nothing, brother. You think I'm trying to start something? <laughs> Why do you think you were not on the Kings of Comedy? They edited an interview I did and made it seem as though I was saying, don't go Steve, see Steve, come see me. How did you get in those Friday movies? Was that just audition or just a phone call? You know, a lot of people complain, and I don't know who they had representing them. But dog, I got paid. Right. And uh, uh, when I did Friday After Next, because uh, I had gotten so much for next Friday, when I did Friday After Next, I bumped head with the producers. Comic View or Deaf Comedy Jam? Uh, far as what? Far as what it did for comedy. Are you familiar with what just happened with Corey Holcomb and Donnell Rollins? Miles, my mile. M I L D. You catch up. You ain't have so. come through the streets or the gutters and straight bull and if you want to ask somebody ask the mother that you know 32 i rip you rip lights i rip you 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 ask any ever see me bomb anybody and you ask anybody that don't know me i keep it gangster i don't, I don't say you no bomb. you trying to say i'm a bum i ain't no bum no, I didn't say and i bomb. saw that saw Yo. Is we talking about comedy. He said, DZ, I went and saw Kevin Hart. And he did an hour. I said, yeah. And he didn't offend nobody in the building. I said, I can't do five minutes without <laughs> making somebody's ass itch. That niggas want to loan me to death. It's a little loan. Yeah, so exactly. It's my man loan. That's my man too. Both loans. Old loan, new loan. <laughs> loan. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, All ops must know it's up there and it's stuck there, nigga. When it's up there, man, it's stuck there. Shut up. Yo, 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 yo. Welcome to another episode of It's Up There Podcast. I am your active and attractive host for another episode of the fastest growing podcast in the world right now. Um, I don't talk to everybody, man. When I seen this guy in my city uh, come to the legendary Zanies, I made it my mission to go out to see this man because I grew up off of him, and I think that he's a legend in the game. Today we got Don D.C. Curry. How are you, my brother? I'm doing good, man, but don't, don't call me legend. Legend's got about six months to live. <laughs> you don't believe that. <laughs> you don't believe that. I appreciate you coming, man. man I appreciate uh, you for, for giving me and gracing me, uh, gracing the platform with your, with your presence, man. You did a lot in this game. How do you feel about the state of comedy right now? Well... It, it, I couldn't think of a better time to be a comedian with all the, with all that's going on now. I remember when you used to have to take a story or the news or whatever and turn it up a notch to make it funny. But now, what's going on now? You got to turn it, take it and turn it down a notch to make it believable. Cause everybody think you're making it up if you just 
just tell what's really happening now. But with regards in particular to black comedy, uh, while it's funny on one hand, it's sad on another hand because you spend your whole life fighting for equal rights and all that, and then what happens, it appears, what, it, what does it appear is gonna happen in the end? We gonna implode. You know, we, why, why do you we, think we exploding from within. Why you think that? Well, I think part of it is, is uh, well, part of it is just, uh, see, people wanna refer to it as uh, competition, it being a competitive game and all that, but I don't wish nobody ill will. So when they mentioned uh, going on Shay Shay, is that his name? Yeah, yeah, Shay Shay. They mentioned on going there with me. I said, you don't want me. I'd be the boringest interview you ever had because I know something on everybody, but I ain't telling nothing. Right. I don't know nothing. Right. It's the equivalent to me when you put somebody's personal business out there of snitching. Right. Same thing, man. Same thing. So is that how you felt about what Cat done? Cat, my buddy, he said some of the shit was right and some of it was wrong. He ain't reading no 3,000 books a year. Right. That's nine books a day, That's fool. Cap. You ain't running no 4,340. Hell, if you could, you should have ran that when that 15-year-old boy was whipping your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that, too. But Cat, my man, man, but I'm proud of... Uh, you know, I'm proud of some brothers that he might disagree with, you know. Now, some of the stuff he said was true. I just wouldn't be airing it on think. It's the public, truth disrespect, man. though. Well, I'm going to tell you why I drew the line. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. A couple of things that were debatable. But I tell you a couple of, I tell you a couple of things I had a problem with. Unless a brother's wife is in the game. That's kind of off limits. That's those, those are old gangster rules, man. Yeah. You don't mess with the family. Wife and children. Yeah. Now, in the case of Kevin Hart, his ex-wife is in the game. So, I don't know. Maybe that's fair. Fair enough. But, you know, he said something about some of the other guys' wives. I, you know, I got a little problem with that. Then, then when he referred to Quake's illiteracy, or accused him of being illiterate. I got a pro I got I got a little problem with that. I mean, the Quake situation seemed to be a lie. So I mean, we should you, everybody got an issue with lies. You know what I'm saying? Because Quake went on Breakfast Club and said he was, I think, in the Navy or Armed He was Force. in the Air Force. Air Force. So I think it was, yeah. Right. It's impossible to be illiterate um going through the Air Force. So I don't I don't know if that checked out as far as what Quake was saying, you know, I, I really don't. Um, but do you harbor any resentment? Like, do you do you feel like because fifty million views, fifty something million, fifty over fifty million? Yeah, that's that's a lot of money. Not yeah. not cash, but just in this world that we operate. Oh, in. he can sell some tickets. Bro. Yeah, so I'm saying they don't give you a hand shot. Like Cass say, they don't look out for me. Why am I holding their secrets? Yeah, but sometimes it's a matter of your soul, man. I was with Cat. We was hanging out one day, and I reminded him back in the day. I, yeah, it's a true story. I said, Cat, you know, you know, you still owe me five hundred dollars. We were in New York years ago, and uh, I did a Comedy Central special, and he did something there. But anyway, we happened to end up at the same hotel, same bar after the show, and uh, this show you how green he was at that time, when they paid him, he did a TV show, and they he thought they were gonna get him cash. <laughs> but they wrote him a check. Yeah. He didn't have no money. Right. So I gave him $500, loaned him $500, so I, I asked him the other day, I said, hey man, you know you still owe me that $500. And he couldn't, he said, is that right, DC? So I tried to refresh his mind and everything. He said, he said, DC, have you told anybody that? I said, no, player. <laughs> I don't I don't roll like that. Yeah. He said, that, that's the difference between you and me, DC. He said, if you told somebody that, you'd have 10 million hits tonight. 
I said, but I don't throw nobody under the bus like that. He said, that's why you're a great comedian, but I'm more famous. <laughs> that's what that he makes said sense. to me, man. That's sad, but that's how this- There's another that, part of that story that I, I tell you when we off the air. <laughs> right. So with, with, I don't think, I think you, from where you come from, y'all have a certain cadence, right, with comedy. I don't know if it's 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 moving to the new era with these comics. Um, do you see anybody in the new era that kind of reminds you of what y'all were when you were coming up? Well, I think uh, the new cats, and I ain't mad at them, nah. man. I think they kind of struggling to find their way, just like we were. I think uh, social media, I don't think, I know, obviously it changed the game, but, uh, you know, some in some ways it's been good because it exposes them to different flavors. But uh, a lot of things ain't changed. When I was coming up, you know, there was some older comics in the game, fewer, of course, than it is now. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't think to try to help you, man. Yeah, they wouldn't. I'm mean, gonna tell you, four or five of them that helped me, but a lot of them was just haters, man. Yeah, they, a lot of them were haters. Uh, John Witherspoon helped me. Uh, George Wallace, who's still alive, he about 160. Uh, J. Anthony Brown, 140. <laughs> Renardo Ray, Richard Pryor, and uh, it was six. It was somebody else. But for the most part, they wasn't that forthcoming with information. So what I've tried to do. Cause ain't nobody, you ain't no threat to me. Right. And I've tried to share all I could share with the young brothers who ask me. You know, ask me, I ain't trying to push nothing on nobody. But if they ask me, I'd, I'd tell them. Why, why do you think you were not on the Kings of Comedy? Well, first place, I ain't no King of Comedy. I don't consider myself no King of Comedy. You don't? But they told me, no. No, but they told me at the time that uh, it was because I didn't have a television show. D.L. Hughley had D.L. Hughley show, Bernie had Bernie show, Steve and Cedric were on Steve Harvey show. Why? why? I was on Grace Under Fire. (laughs) 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 Why do do we feel like you, you, you try to downplay it though? Like. I ain't, I, ain't, I shouldn't have been on no kings of comedy. I ain't no king of comedy. You just told me Richard Pryor helped you. John Witherspoon helped you. I had you. three conversations with Richard Pryor. I don't want to overemphasize that. Like yeah, I, nah, could, but I could just pick up the phone and call Richard. But, I had three conversations with Richard Pryor. But to but be they in were the very game, impactful and very, uh, you know, he he was very open with me. And at that time, he he was uh, like on his going out on his last leg. But he was uh, he was real, you know. Yeah, but, but to, to, when I, and even if whatever Richard Pryor gave you in that moment, that that was that. But to be in the game from then to now, how has that not solidified being a king? Bro, king, king, strong word, bro. Let me make that clear because I know how y'all take shit and twist it. I ain't no queen. <laughs> 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 I ain't saying that when I say I ain't no king. No, man. Uh, I'm just uh don't and I'm not I'm not trying to be overly modest or nothing. I ain't, I ain't no slouch now. You ain't nothing like nothing no I think is. I can hold my own. Yeah. Against, against, Some people will say Harvey has your cadence. Well, Some people will say that Harvey has your cadence. That's your cadence. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, so that's what I don't understand like Steve, my man, man. Steve, my man. You know, I saw him and Mark Curry arguing. Look, bro, when you came up in the same general time frame, you're going to have some overlapping of things that uh, you got in common. Mark Curry and Steve were going at it about a Halloween costume. Come on, man. All black folk, for the most part, made the Halloween costume. So some of that stuff, but you know when you write something and you got your signature on it and somebody snatch it from you. Now that has happened to me in some cases. 
you even got a certain style, bro. What I'm saying is when you deal with jokes, at least from the outside, me looking in, it's like the packaging of the joke is just as important as the joke. And so your cadence, just how you just did now with the inflections and things of that nature, right? When you see someone like you coming up in that moment with comic view and all that was going on, that was you, Harvey, all y'all was kind of in that same pot. That cadence is only, I don't know anyone else with that, but really you too. I don't know, I'm talking about where I can close my eyes and, and say that rhythm, that's that rhythm. That's yeah. that DC rhythm. Like, do you do you ever think that? Do you ever feel that? Do you ever? You trying to start some shit, man. I ain't trying to start nothing, brother. You think I'm trying to start something? <laughs> these, are, these are my real thoughts. Like, when I hear this, even when going back, just listening as I was driving down, I'm like, oh, shit. Let me listen to Harvey. I put Harvey in. Now, what, what I would say is different was he, he would do a little more acting with, with it. But if you close your eyes, and this is only two or three bits that I saw, but if I close my eyes, I say that Cadence belongs to D.C. Here, you want me to say? <laughs> All right. Well, move, hey, we, can, we, can move, we can move on. We can move on, but you know, I just wanted to ask you that. Let me say something. Point. Here's in case Steve see this. You know, he's had several problems with me. Uh, I'll tell you about a couple of them. Uh, we were doing a show in Memphis one time back in the day, and he had just gotten his toupee. And we were in the dressing room, it was a low ceiling, and they had a ceiling fan. And I suggested he get out from under the ceiling fan before he snatched his toupee off. And after that, he didn't speak to me for about three years. Damn. Another time, well, I ain't gonna tell that. <laughs> but we've had just two or three run out. Another time, I was in Houston. He was at the Civic Center, I think it was. I was at a club. They edited an interview I did and made it seem as though I was saying, don't go Steve, see Steve, come see me. That ain't what I said. They, they cut it down and made it look like that. Right. But what I said was, you can go to see Steve at the arena, but it's gonna be hard to see in that arena, I was talking about the intimacy of comedy clubs. And I said, I'll be at this club, and for what it's worth, Steve might sell out, but a club I was at set 250 people. I know I'm gonna sell out. <laughs> I said something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He took it and got on the radio after that and, and uh, you know, tried to, tried to insult me, which he couldn't do. I got some tapes, man. Steve had a comedy club, you know. And uh, I got some tapes of me performing at his comedy club. So uh, I just there, there's been some overlapping, but, you know. And then for whatever. me, bro, in this game, because I take it personal, you know, me. And I, I don't know if it's the dog is in me. You seem like a player. You seem like a super cool player type nigga. So I don't take you to be sensitive. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I ain't, man, right. you had to really, you had to been, you had, yeah. you really had to, you really had to. You can't hardly insult me. Bro. Right, right. But with the money though, it's just like yo, man. With the money, I don't know. Like I, I commend you for being so player about it. But I can't see, you know, certain things for me will be a little more visible in my arguments, right? Because I'll be saying. You Let know. me tell you something, man. When I talk about money. Yeah, I like money like anybody else, bro. right? It, it, it does not control me, brother. And, you know, for example, there's only so much shit you can buy. After that, you can buy bigger shit, more shit. You know, you can buy a house. Then if you get a house, you can buy another house. But, I mean, there's only so much shit you can buy. Right. But if you compare yourself to somebody who's super, you want to call it successful or whatever, <laughs> if a man got a $50 million plane, $50 million jet, but I don't want one. 
I just made fifty million dollars, mm. relatively speaking. Mm. God bless Beyonce and Jay Z. They bought a two hundred million dollar house, but in my mind, because of where I come from, you know what I could buy with two hundred million dollars? Mm. Two hundred million dollar house. Right. I rather. And I'm not shooting. I'm not shooting shit. God bless them for what they did. Right. But I cannot imagine uh, what a two hundred million dollar house is. This right. some bitch on the moon or something. Right. Well, where did you grow up at? Southside Chicago. Got that play on you, man. Finger high. It wanted. Wasn't scared, got that of, wasn't play scared on. of nothing back then. All my partners was gangsters. Yes, I Lord. go back now. I be scared to stop at a stop sign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, are you familiar with what just happened with Corey Holcomb and Donnell Rollins? No. But uh, <laughs> I had uh, Cookie Hull on my show. Uh, she basically was uh, rebutting Cats interview. Right. Cookie Ho used to work for him. She said she used to write for him. He said she didn't. I kind of believe she, that she did. But at any rate, and I'm trying to be careful now not throw nobody under the bus. But Corey Holcomb called me because he saw me basically interviewing her on my show, this Ray. Right. And uh, he called me because he was finna go in on her. And uh car gangster, man. But I got to give him props for calling me. And uh, before he did that. Before he did it, basically, yeah. you know. Yeah. Not getting my permission, but I like, like I brought her on, man. Hey, man, you say what you, what you think. She said what she think. I didn't condemn it or condone it. Yeah. But I felt she had a right to say it. And it's a fact that she accompanied Kat in whatever whatever capacity for quite some time. And she wanted to speak her piece. And she did. And it, it wasn't uh, friendly. But, you know, <laughs> she's a woman. You know, you had my ex on. Ain't no telling what the hell she saying. Right. Did how how did you get in for uh, those Friday movies? Was that just audition or just a phone call? No, I auditioned. They called me, you know, from stand up back then, man. The scouts and stuff for television and movies, they would go out, and then yeah, black comedy was so hot then. They go to the black comedy clubs in different cities. So it used to be a place here. I used to go to Comedy Act Theater, uh, and. Uh, they came in there. Now, I had turned them down three or four times. People from BET had come in there, and they were asking me to come out and basically audition to be the host of Comic View on my dime. I'm like, man, go on with that shit. I just stay right here and work in this club and make this $75 a week. Yeah. <laughs> that was what I was getting, man, 14 nah. shows. Yeah, nah. And uh, so finally, I think it was the third go round. They bought me a ticket and and uh, said they pay for hotel. I said okay then. Now you now you talking, but back then the, the scouts would go out. Now you pretty much got to go to New York or L.A. They don't they don't travel like they used to looking for talent. But anyway, they flew me out there for Comic View and uh, I think that's where Cube saw me. And some at some point we got called and they asked me to come in and quote unquote read. For the part, and uh, I went in, and and uh, it was a wrap. That's dope. dope. Was that yeah. good money back then? You know, a lot of people complaining. I don't know who they had representing them. <laughs> but dog, I got paid. Right. And uh, uh, when I did Friday after next, because uh, I had gotten so much for next Friday, when I did Friday after next, I bumped head with the producers. Because Cube, at that point, it gotten so big, Cube had basically stepped out of the negotiations and stuff. So I bumped head with the producers and uh, 
So later on that evening, I called Q. And I said, hey man, you know, you can cut this if you want. I said, these motherfuckers crazy. And Q said, well, you know, what's up, DC? And I said, well, we just we can't come to grips with the money. Ice Cube said to me, DC, what you want? And I told him. He said, call him back in 15 minutes. <laughs> and I come back 15 minutes, they asked me when I could come in and sign the papers. I said, damn, I was too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you needed a little pushback. But just like that, man. So yeah, well, Kim Whitley, who didn't do Friday at the next, because she had bumped head with the producer. But I told her, call Cube. You know Cube. Right. We all talking, we was on set. Right. I said, call Cube. And she wouldn't do it. So that's when they went and basically got uh, some more. Who was my friend? I'm doing with her now. They went and got some more to basically replace Kim Whitley. Wow. That's dope. Do, um, comic View or Def Comedy Jam? Uh, Far as what? Far as what it did for comedy, uh, who who it propelled, um, cachet in the culture, you know, overall. I think Def Jam was the ultimate. Uh, at that time, it, it was the ultimate thing, Def Jam. Comic View had more uh, longevity. It was a calmer atmosphere. It was kind of two different. Uh, Generous Def Jam, you know. Uh, comic View, you had time to make somebody think. Def Jam, you got to go, bro. Yeah, yeah, you got yeah, to go. Yeah. But uh, both of them did the thing. Uh, so shout out to Russell Simmons, shout out to Bob uh, Johnson, I think. Johnson, yeah. Bob Johnson, yeah. yeah. So both of them provided. Uh, Avenue Bob Sumner was with Def Jam, but Bob Johnson on BT, BT Comic View, yeah, yeah, and it created a it created a platform for us that uh, wasn't available. I don't I don't think you can compare it to anything now, as far yeah. as black comics are concerned, right? Yeah, so you think it can be re recreated in there that can be redone now? You can centralize those audiences because basically that's what that was. People would sit down. At a certain time, you know, get looking forward to watching comedy on Comic View or I tell you what, I don't think so because of social media. I don't think so because of social media. Now I ain't I ain't mad at nobody or nothing. I ain't mad at the young brothers social media, but but I think uh, and it's obvious when some of them are missing the experience of going out on the road, driving from place to place, dealing with different people, and trying to. Uh, find where you fit in. And you can't do that. You can't do that with video, man. And then it's not as real. Right. Because you can't get booed on video. And you gotta get your ass out there and get booed. Mm -hmm. And then figure out what you did wrong. But on video, you can do 50 takes and just pick the best one. Then a lot of people disappointed when they show up to see it. Now some of the brothers have gone on and gained experience and uh, Stepped it up, Country Wayne, Shula King, yeah, and figured it out. But I've also seen, I've seen some fall. DC Young Fly, I've seen some fall by the wayside. You know that right. that possibly would have done better if they had been on the road. Uh, it used to call the Chitlin Circuit. Yeah, because working those jokes is a thing. Like you got to get that joke in different rooms and you know what right. I'm saying like you said like it's and that's why you know I do some concerts now I think I got 40 50 on the books for this year but I do I got you know 40 some clubs on the books because the repetitions right the repetitions and you'd be surprised I always call comedy particularly black comedy but comedy in general is psychological warfare brother and you'd be surprised how changing a word or a phrase or the time it make all the difference in the world. When you're doing a club and you got several several shows to do day after day, you know you can work it out. You got time to work it out. Yeah, yeah. And then you see it. It. You also got to serve people that don't know you as much too, right? Because 
especially with social media, the fanfare is so crazy. Yeah. It's like you come out, they cheering. It's like he ain't even got nothing out. <laughs> he ain't even said nothing. These dudes are getting that love. And they I wonder the last comics, the last wave of comics that'll make that seventy five dollars a night or a week and all that. They oh, don't even a, feel that no that's more. That's old ain't nobody doing. Yeah, they don't even feel that. My first paid job I opened for Paul Mooney was seventy dollars. Fourteen show. I was getting five dollars a show. And at the end of the end of the week they handed me a note. They said I owed them one hundred and twenty-seven dollars. I had drunk up two hundred and something dollars worth of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Williams and uh, his brother Gary Williams. Yeah. Was there any beef? Well, not beef, but any competition with Comic View and Def Comedy Jam back then? Where it's like no, it, back then there were three things you had to do to establish your legitimacy as a black comic. You had to do Def Jam, Comic View, and Apollo. Apollo. After that, they they take you seriously. Yeah. Yeah, Showtime at the Apollo. Right. And then if you could do that and, and survive, you, you're doing pretty good. Showtime at the Apollo. They talk about Def Jam audience. Showtime at the Apollo, when I first did it, I got that thing called time about 11 o'clock in the morning. And I got up uh, to perform it, I think it was 10 o'clock at night. Same crowd. No water, no refreshment, no nothing, <laughs> man. I don't even know if the bathrooms were working. But they've been sitting there 11 hours when I got up. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> but you know, uh, it was it was all in the game. Right. Man. Nah, them, them the reps, though. Yeah, them the reps. Get the reps in, yeah. man. You learn about TV and so forth. But uh, the reps, you know, they don't. Uh, and God bless them, you know. A lot of making a lot of money, man. But uh, you know, I stand hard on on what I believe. I'm I'm uh, including radio shows now. I'm I'm eleven thousand and something deep. Yeah, you. I'm telling you, man. I don't know why. I don't know. You don't got to like it. I'm calling you a legend. <laughs> you ain't even got to like it. And my voice matter in the culture. So whatever. But here, here's something I also want to ask you. Um, when. Corey Holcomb, speaking of those reps, sometimes comedians even say seasoned comics are quote unquote mild. So Corey Holcomb says that Donnell Rollins is a mild comic. Yeah. Do you do you understand that term and what what do you what do you think that means? Cause I'm sure my viewing audience don't know what that means. Don't know kind of what a mild. I know what it means because I know what mild wings is versus hot wings. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it ain't funny. Corey, Corey Holcomb is wild. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm I'm a, I'm a Corey Holcomb fan, Me but too. some of the stuff Corey be saying, I'll be like, damn, boy. Yeah. What is wrong with you? But it's funny. However, and I don't want to. I don't want to reiterate what Cat said or what Corey said. There is a certain vein that if you get in that vein, you are more likely to become universally acceptable and blah blah blah. I, I've never. I've always spoke my mind. I had a conversation. I don't know twenty some years ago with Tom Joyner, You know about being more accommodating. So yeah, it might could have been it. Now you take a guy like Kevin Hart. A guy was telling me the other day, uh, we were talking about comedy. He said, DZ, I went and saw Kevin Hart, and he did an hour. I said, oh, yeah. And he didn't offend nobody in the building. I said, I can't do five minutes without <laughs> making somebody's <laughs> ass itch. Yeah. But if you got that talent, God bless you if that's what you can do. But you know, I'm more of a, I'm, I'm a little radical, bro. Yeah, I mean, but the truth is the, the truth is considered that. You yeah. know what I mean? When you get up there and just literally say your observations from a true standpoint, some people going to say it's radical. Yeah, you got to live with that. I speak it and then I I can defend myself. Yeah. And uh sometimes that's that's uh that's interpreted as being radical. And then I don't give a damn for it. Right, so so Donnell Rawlins ran up on Corey at a at the Hollywood Improv hmm. and interrupted his set. I ain't see that. Yeah, and just hollering at him, saying, "Nigga, I'm a beast." 
You talking about I'm a mild comic, I'm a beast, I'm a beast, right? <laughs> now I didn't I know I did not know about that. You're right. Corey tell him in his face, it, man, yeah. that shit mild you doing, man. Yeah. And they kind of had this one too. What I want to speak to though is, <laughs> is that Corey crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I want to speak to is the conversation surrounding it because the 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 conversation surrounding that event is that, yo. Donnell really is doing that because what Corey said about Dave, which is Dave Chappelle bombs a lot. Yeah, I saw that. Right. I saw Corey say that. Do, do, you, do you agree with that? I mean, I feel comics bomb. Like, do you think Corey is wrong in his observation for being able to say that? Like, he said, yo, when they, when they on stage, I go outside. I don't, I don't like what they doing. But for Dave, he's a good comic, but he bombs a lot. Well, I don't know if you can bomb if you got two or three hundred million dollars. So I, I I think he's at a point where he just goes up and he talking, he working stuff out in his mind, he watching the crowd, they react, he just talking. He ain't gotta go up and slam the room. He doesn't he doesn't have to. The reason it gets hard, it gets harder and harder for a comic to be successful, a black comic, as he progresses economically is because black folk are about poverty. Most of us just a generation, maybe two from poverty, man. Yeah. But when you got, when you are perceived as having, when you have or are perceived as having hundreds of millions of dollars, it's very hard for a black crowd to sit down and listen to you talk about how hard it is to pay bill. Right. I had this conversation with Arsenio, who my partner I talked to him all the time. Right. When you got when you got millions of dollars, it's hard for you to connect with a man that spent his last fifty dollars to sit in the bleachers in the nosebleed section and see you. So it it becomes a thing with But comedy is the one place in the culture where it's like it's fair game. Like that money don't excuse you. If you're not funny, you're not funny. Well, you might be funny to some people. And you may be funny to the right or wrong people. Biggest lie I ever told about comedy is funny is funny. That's bullshit. Because it depends on who's who's talking and it depends on who you're talking to. That's why I refuse to do. I've got a lot of offers for for uh, seas across for shows across the water, across the sea. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the hell to say over there. I ain't lived over there. I don't know nothing. And I be talking <laughs> about I, I be talking about how America is crazy. So I don't want to go to a foreign country and and do that. I can't go to an army base and talk about how crazy America is. Right. So I just I just turn them down, man. But it depends on who you're talking to. And who's talking to say funny is funny. If you believe that, Richard Pryor, for example, could have taken Bill Cosby's material and been as effective. Ain't no way in hell. Right. Bill Cosby could go up and do Richard Pryor material and be effective. No. Right. It's a, it's a, there's an intricacy, an intimacy, a, and I, I, I think you develop that more, my personal opinion. In clubs, you know, right. uh, concerts are hit. They they bang bang, man, and and uh, and the uh, you got to get out of there. The union, you, know, you got to get out of there. Yeah, you yeah, go yeah. do twenty minutes. You get up there and do thirty if you want to. Right. They hit that red <laughs> light. It's time to go. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have you ever shared the stage with someone like, you know, the new style like the eighty five South boys is doing? You see how they kind of like. It's it's a it's a three way kind of thing on stage at the same time. Is that an awkward thing for 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 like the old school for y'all guys that came up one man one mic just taking care of the business? Hey man, to me it's a individual sport. Now God bless them, they've been very successful. Right. Uh, but no, this that's not it's not what I'm about. Do do you think that you are a part of Hollywood because you've been in a few movies? No. On the contrary, man. On the contrary, man. I've uh, 
you know, they talk about bowing down all that to Hollywood. I just never have, uh, even now, I refuse some auditions because, I mean, you know, it's all of a shit show, man. Now, I'll come in and audition for something worthwhile, but you know me come in and and basically showcase something. Well, why you call me? Right. Because you know what I do. You know what I'm about. So don't call me and ask me to come in and do Jane Bryan. <laughs> right. Because that's what it feels like. It definitely feels like. I was talking to um another comic I had, Nav Green, when he was doing Coming to America. He was kind of explaining the audition process. And he just like they're sitting there stale face and just looking at you like you got shit on your face. And then... And I've experienced this, you know, because it's an audition game. You know, you go in, you may audition for 30 shows and get one commercial or something. But you go in there, man, and it's it's kind of an insult. You go in there and sit down in some uh, and some 22-year-old white girl decide whether you get the part or not. That's a hard period. God bless swallow. you if you're 17 trying to make it. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I ain't about that nah, shit. Nah, nah, nah. Do you feel like you made enough money out of this game? Enough to do what? To feel like I ain't I ain't built. I feel good about, I put in 40 years, this is what I got from it. Or however, you know. I probably made more than I could have made doing anything else. But you know, answer. like I said, man, I'm a... I'm content. I ain't satisfied. I ain't got enough money. Yeah. But I'm all right. After you buy certain things, ain't nothing much. And you can't buy nothing else. Right. You know, you could have a $200 million house, but I got a house. You know, you could have a $5 million car, but I got a car. Right. So, I mean, relatively speaking, if you got something I don't want, we even. Right. You got fifty million dollar jet that's and I don't want game, one. Boy. I just made fifty million dollars. That's a relative. That's a good game right there. Yeah. That's but a I good game I right there, boy. I don't want for nothing, man. Le, le, uh, do you think do you think that in this game, in the comedy world that there's for Tubi, are you interested in doing movies on Tubi? Would you do something like that? I got a deal on the uh I got a deal on the table with them now. I did a television show. AIB Productions put up uh, most of the money. I put up the rest. It's called Nappy Valley. You know, I'm a farmer. And it's about all my my partners uh, working. I bought a new farm. And it's about all my partners coming to work, uh, turn this land into a farm, you know. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'm 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 open to it. I'm open to that. Yeah, cause there's some young entrepreneurs, you know, running around with some bags over in Tubi World that yeah. reach for your cachet in this culture. You know what I mean? Yeah, Put yeah, a yeah. number out, and you'll be surprised that phone will ring. Hey, we got yeah. that. We got that number for you. You know? Yeah, and you know, and I, you know, you do it, and you go at your own pace. I shot a special that I was offered. Uh, a couple people offered to finance. I financed it myself. That's dope. And I got to finish editing it now, and then I shot it in uh, Birmingham, Alabama at the Start Dome. But uh, I own it, you know? Right. Is that expensive process to shoot a special? It cost me 40 something thousand dollars. That's dope. I imagine you could spend more if you want to do it a certain way. I imagine yeah. you could do it and spend less. But The that, return that's on that, how do you make your money back from that? Well, in the case of me owning it, I'm free to basically lease it out. So I could get it, Netflix could buy into it, Tubi, whatever, but I still own it. Right. As opposed to if I let them put the money up and then it's a wrap. Right. And they could buy it and put it on the shelf. So you'll be doing more so of a licensing agreement where they'll just license your content for a couple of years, pay you, and then exactly. you retain ownership after the agreement. Exactly. That's dope. Exactly, and I, I believe in the project. I believe it's uh, bona fide and, and uh, and I'm a gambler, so I financed it my damn self. Yeah, I respect that. How often do you write jokes? I write every day, but some of it ain't funny. <laughs> 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 I'm going to tell you what I do, man. I do satire, man. It's getting a lot, e it's a lot easier now because you got your phone, man. I do satire, and I, 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 I kind of do current events. 
and stuff. But sometimes I just be writing and don't be don't really be funny. <laughs> but then something will happen. Something will happen in 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 the world in society that makes it relevant. So I'll be like, I wrote something about how unfair it is for a brother to live uh, on a certain side of Atlanta. And then something will happen that makes it relevant. You right. know what I mean? Right. But I, I write pretty much every day, but most of it end up in the trash. <laughs> Do you think that you can start off funny in, in comedy and run out of funny? Yeah, if you don't stay current and stay on what's happening, because, you know, most comics start off talking about the same thing, farting on the elevator. Yeah. A woman, period, which ain't never been funny. I'll be watching <laughs> them bomb with that. I'll be like, that ain't going to work, player. It's some shit you just can't make it funny, man. You will sit through a bomb, man. I'll sit through one? Yeah. I said through a bunch of them. They funny to me. Yeah, people, the comics tend to laugh at bombs. So. Oh, man. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something that's changed. Back in the day, guys in my era, we would go up some nights like with their open mic night was big back then for black comics. And we would go up some night and challenge each other. I ain't going to say nothing I ever said before. Do or die. If I bomb, I just bomb. Yeah. And then after the show, we go to Waffle House and sit till the sun come up, man. And... And be critiquing each other, you know. Nigga, you should have said this. Right. You should have said that. You should have said yeah. that. So it wasn't that, it wasn't that like it is now, you know. That's that, one, that's my material. Right. We used to go in there, we used to go in there and literally, man, we would help each other write and uh bump up, bump up jokes. We like, you know, that's a funny concept, man. Right. But what you said wasn't the shit. <laughs> And we would go back and forth, and it was all, uh, it was a camaraderie now that it doesn't, it's not the same. No, nah, but that's one thing I think 85 South got. Even though yeah. they shut us, they got that camaraderie because yeah. they ain't worried about each other stealing the joke or running yeah. off. With social media, it's much more easier to claim ownership over something that's not yours. Mm. Right over the idea, of something if your following's bigger, yeah. um, or or something like that, you 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 re, you retain ownership or whatever that is that you presented. But I think that's unfortunate. Um, but I got some stuff back then. You know, I used to travel with a little old, uh, them little bitty cassette recorder. What you call it? They mini recorder. I forgot what they call. Yeah, I could listen. I could let you. I could let you listen to some shit. You would be like, that sounds very familiar. You ain't got to tell me. I'm tell, I'm trying to get. I'm trying to understand why you are you saying it. You know, even some stuff is coincidence, and some some stuff you you know you know what the deal is. I don't believe in that, man. Like I, I mean, but I think you're a player. You know, a capital P. So I respect how you handle it. Bro, let know? me tell you how I describe myself. I'm a gentleman and a gangster. Facts. But I ain't I ain't trying to bring nobody else down. God bless you. Yeah. Um, back in the day, do you think I was talking to a comic and, and I want to ask you about it, seeing that you was in the era or just around and know about comedy? Um, Andrew Dice Clay. Yeah. Was Maybe. his wave as big as um as as it's presented to to the culture? Because they well, he was like, setting that Madison Square Garden, blah 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 blah. But his longevity wouldn't. Right. He didn't, you know, so he, he jumped out the gate. And back then, because uh, comedy wasn't exposed like it is now, so you had another factor that now is, so you had the shock factor. Right, shock jock. Yeah, so yeah. you had, you, I mean, you could be shocking and not really be that funny. Right. Andrew Dice K was shocking. They, was, yeah. they couldn't believe he was saying that shit. He was selling that Madison Square Garden, man, three, four shows a day. Right. Uh, but it's longevity, so I might, uh, you know, I got a saying, man, uh, you know, because I don't be in no hurry to do nothing. I, I, my saying is, my saying, pace yourself, don't race yourself. Right. And uh, he jumped out there, and he was he was rolling for a while, and after that, you know. And with social media now, and then uh, Def Jam and all that, that's one thing it did that I feel was positive. It removed all that shock shit. Yeah. Because back then, they'd be, you, oh, you hear what he said? He shocked. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily funny. 
But now the people that grew up on Def Jam and stuff, man, they 40, 50 years old. So you ain't gonna score no points just shocking somebody. Right. I think back then we they had, and we're we're gonna wrap it up after this. Back then, um, they had Eddie Murphy as well doing yeah. the stand up thing. He was was he competitors? Was that a comp- competition thing? Like, were they selling out at the same time? Who was running alongside Dice Clay when he was doing that? Because he was using rap, hip hop shit, and I'm just wondering who Black was moving around at the same time then, like on that scale. It was probably only Eddie. Yeah. In in that in that group, it's probably only Eddie, man. Uh, but if you talking about uh, if you talking about the skill of performing and the skill of comedy and substance, Andrew Dice Clay couldn't touch it. Right. And I always tend to think white comedy can't really, even though it from from a just by numbers it's gonna sell and, and do certain things. But when we, I think people enjoy black comedy more than white comedy. Cause it's more funny. Yeah, <laughs> I believe that. I don't know if it's wrong to say, like, but that's hey, that's man, my I'm opinion. Damn it, yeah. bro. it's funny, yeah, man. Yeah, that's my. And opinion. then it's all just like I was saying, giving the example of, uh, uh, you know, if you a comic, if you made millions of dollars, it becomes harder for you because to connect. The whole thing is about connecting with your audience. Mm. So how you gonna be up there and? You got three hundred million dollars, or perceived to be, have three hundred million. Right. That's why Eddie and them can't perform no more. Right. Cause black comedy about hard times. You know about them bills coming. You ain't got no money, and you cannot realistically or convincingly talk about that when you got two hundred, three hundred million dollars, man. Right. Anybody trying to hear that? You and come off with phony. So you are gonna have to go up there like the white boy and talk about it. You were talking to the goldfish this morning. <laughs> and the goldfish said. Right. You know. So I said that to say it's hard for the quote unquote oppressor to entertain the oppressed. Mm. Now the oppressed can entertain the oppressor. Yeah. But it, it but it's it's hard. It's hard for it's hard for a person who's been uh, uh, on the easy route, so to speak, to make me laugh. And uh, yeah, you just alienate yourself. The problem I got with, and you know, uh, I got some Mexicans work for me, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, Immigration taking over. The problem I got with it is, see, the history of America, man. Even though you know they coming over here five, six thousand deep a day, I ain't with that. When you got poor folk over here already that you claim you can't feed, but I got a problem raising hell about the Mexicans coming over here voluntarily when my people were brought over here against their will. Mm. So it's hard for me even though I realize the economics of it, it's hard for me to be standing up hollering, don't let the Mexicans in here, don't let the Mexicans in here. And my people, I'm here as a result of you bringing my people over here against their will. Now, I'm gonna get over here and get halfway up on my feet, and then I'm gonna be talking about don't let them voluntarily come come over here to work, and you brought me over here to work. Mm. You brought my people over here against their will to work. So, you know. Deep. <laughs> Something to think about, for real. That's, yeah. that's, some, that's some shit to think about. That's why I respect comedians that that, that are observation of it all. Yeah, you know well, that's I mean? why I respect Mexicans. <laughs> that nigga crazy. <laughs> 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 hey, yo, man, it's up there podcast, DC Curry, man. I appreciate you, brother. Well, Great love, conversation, man. I man. Appreciate Thank you, you so much, down, bro. man. Yeah. I wanted to get with you today, man, but uh, them clubs, they be wearing my ass out, man. I already know. 
I already know it. I appreciate you, bro. You're a legend. Right on, brother. You're a legend, man, man. Stop calling me that, man. Y'all stop take calling game, me that. Do Legends that. got about six months to live. <laughs> stop it. I appreciate, appreciate anything you. I said that ain't acceptable is because of that shit you was smoking. <laughs> he blamed it on me. It's on me. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Right on, man. You good, man. You a pro, man. Yes, sir, man. Thank you, brother. Right on. Thanks for watching this clip from It's Up There podcast. To see the rest of the interview, click one of the boxes on the screen. Also join. Discord and Patreon to be in our community.